Today we were mainly, if not at everything was focusing on bipartite entanglement. Okay, so today we will continue with the bipartite entanglement and we will see that many of the things there can be generalized to multipartite systems. Can you hear me? Better now? Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what we were discussing uh, yesterday was, first of all, a separability problem. So we were looking at mixed states, and then we moved on to pure states. Sorry. And we were convincing ourselves that entanglement theory is a resource theory where the free operations are LOCC, so everything that we can do locally, and the free states are the separable states. So just to remind you, LOCC means that we can apply local operations on LA systems, you can apply some operations, you can communicate some result to Bob, he can then, depending on this outcome, make some measurement, communicate the result back, and so on. Okay, so this is what we call LOCC. And entanglement theory considers this for free, so this doesn't cost anything. If you want to do something more fancy than that, then you need entanglement. Okay, and we were saying yesterday also that you can measure entanglement, and if I'm not wrong, this was uh, point B, and we saw, for instance, that one measure of entanglement of a pure state, of a pure bipartite state, would be the entropy of the reduced density matrix. Right? So now, the next question that we should address is how can we sort states? So this was actually C. So now we are at D. How can we sort states or states according to their entanglement that they contain? Well, we know already this answer because we have discussed yesterday that if I can go from some state via LOCC to some other state, then the entanglement in that state has to be large or equal to the entanglement of phi for any entanglement measure E. Right? So this means that LOCC induces some kind of order in a set of states. Okay, so if I can go from psi to phi via LOCC, it means that psi is a better resource. Okay? So I get some kind of ordering. The ordering, however, is only partial. <coughs> and this is important. It's only partial because there are states where, so there are pairs of states, psi and phi, such that you can neither go from psi to phi via LOCC, nor can you go the other way around. So nor can you transform phi to psi via LOCC. Okay, so this means that those two states here are not comparable. You cannot go from one to the other. So this means that you cannot say that this is a better resource than that or the other way around. So you cannot order them. Okay, and this is why we have a partial order in contrast to a total order where all two elements are related. Okay, partial order means that it's not for the whole set of states. But for some of them you have that. And so what we have learned yesterday is that LOCC induces such a partial order. Okay, and regarding entanglement theory as a resource theory, this is the most natural choice. Okay? It's the only thing that we can say, because LOCC is for free, and so this is why this state is for sure more, a better resource than this state here. Okay, now what we have also seen yesterday is that this implies also that if two states are LU equivalent, which I write like this, and this means that, as we said also yesterday, that I can write, can find in a bipartite case, so I have two local unitaries. So U1 and U2 are unitaries, and they act on the first and the second system, respectively. And so I can transform, I'd say, psi into phi with local unitaries. If this is the case, then we have seen that E psi has to be equal to E phi for all of them, because simply because I can go from psi to phi with local operations and I can go from phi to psi with local operations. Okay, I can undo the local unitary, because it's unitary. And so this means that we have this inequality in both directions, so we have an equality for whatever entanglement measure we have. Okay, now you might wonder whether the opposite is also true. So if this is true for all E, is it true that then the two states must be LU equivalent? 
That's a very interesting question, not so easy to answer, especially we need some more information, we need some more definitions and, and knowledge about entanglement, monotons, and so on, to be able to answer that. And if we have time, then we will come back to this question. Okay, so is the opposite also true? Okay, so, so far we know, and this is important, that LOCC induces this partial order. Okay, and this is also the reason why one studies LOCC. Okay, because this is a way of telling whether a state is a better resource than another state. Okay, so we get an order in the whole Hilbert space, which is in general very large, as you know. So this also means that, of course, we have to study this LOCC, right? So let's discuss what LOCC is. Okay, so very weak and roughly, we were talking about this already yesterday, so let's do it more precise. Okay, I have a system, I have a party A that holds some system, party B that holds some other system. Now, what is the most general transformation that they can do if they are only allowed to act, so if they're not allowed to use entanglement? Well, Alice, without loss of generality, would start. She applies some POVM, so she applies some generalized measurement with some number of outcomes. She obtains some outcome, Let's say that she obtains outcome I, so she has implemented AI, and she transmits this information to Bob. Now, Bob uses this information, and depending on I, he applies some measurement, which I denote now by BI, and obtains some outcome J. Okay, so he applies this generalized measurement, and he gets some outcome J. Now, he transmits this information again back to Alice. Now, Alice, depending on I and J, chooses a new POVM and gets some outcome K, and so on and so on. Okay, so this continues. Now, the problem is that these have to be, first of all, local measurements, okay? So we have to make sure that they obey the completeness relation. And second of all, one can show that this doesn't end. So there are protocols there are problems where you actually need infinitely many rounds of classical communication. Okay, so this makes this very difficult. This is why LOCC, studying LOCC is so difficult to do. Okay? Let's write down what I mean by why is it difficult. Okay, let's write down what is the whole operation. So what is lambda? What would be the corresponding CP map? So this lambda LOCC corresponding to our protocol would be what? If I act on some state row, I would have what? Well, I start with row, I first apply AI, right? Then Bob applies BJI, depending on the outcome of, of Alice. Then Alice applies uh, AIJK. Bob applies BIJKL, and so on and so on. Okay, there is a tensor product, and we go on, and we have here the sum over all I, J, and so on. Right? And here is our state row, and the whole thing. So this is our transformation. Okay, so this would be our map. Now, there are two things that we see. One is that given such a map, to show that this is LOCC is very difficult because you have to show that each of these operators here factorizes in operators where each of them is a, a complete measurement. Okay, so AI has to fulfill the condition that AI dagger AI is equal to the identity if I sum over I. The same holds true for A, I, J, K. If I sum over K, this has to be the identity. Okay, and so on. So I have all these conditions because these must be valid measurements. This is what they do here, right? So even though you see that these operators here factorize, right? So in, I can write this as a sum of some operators A, I tilde, tensor B, I tilde, Right, because I can call this whole operator here AI tilde and this operator BI tilde. So it will for sure be of this form, which looks pretty innocent. The problem is that for each of these operators, I have to make sure that it factorizes in those. Okay? So this looks simple, and these maps is what is called separable operations. It's called separable because you write a map as a tensor product of local operators. 
okay, and recall the definition of separability. So this is the same thing, but for operators, for maps. Okay, so separable operations are those which can be written in the form that we have up there. So it's just the sum of AI tensor BI, so some local operators, rho AI dagger tensor BI dagger, where this has to be a trace-preserving map, okay? So this means that the whole operators have to obey this condition of completeness. So this has to be true. Okay? So separable maps are defined like that. Any separable map can be written like that and the other way around. All our LOCC operations, as we see, are contained in the set of separable operations. Okay, so this is an important message. So LOCC is contained <coughs> at the moment we have it like this. Okay, now if everything that I can write like that can be implemented locally, so if every separable operation would be LOCC, then our life would be much easier. Because then we just need to deal with those maps and not with these nasty conditions here. Okay, these nasty conditions come from the LOCC condition. But the problem is that this is not true. Okay, so LOCC is strictly contained in SEP. It has been proven that there are separable operations which cannot be realized with LOCC. So this means that if we want to study LOCC, then there is no way that we just study, or it's not directly, that we just study the much easier set of operations, the separable operations, but we really have to deal with this complicated structure here. Okay? And again, this is not only complicated because I have here some products. This is complicated because this doesn't end. Okay? So this goes, up, goes on until infinite. So there are protocols where you need infinitely many rounds. Okay, and so now I have a product of infinitely many operators and I need to check that I can write it as a product of operators that obey all these conditions. And that's of course a mess. Okay, it's very difficult. <laughs> yes, 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 because it has to be realizable with LOCC. Okay, so Alice does something here. So she gets all the possible outcomes, right? Um, so, because here I'm talking about really deterministic transformations, I will come to the stochastic transformations later on. Okay, so this is really the set of LOCC, is this set of, of maps with the additional conditions that this is really realizable, like I explained before. Yes, please? That's a very good question. But the answer is because separable operations cannot be real, so there are separate operations which cannot be realized with LOCC. So if entanglement theory, from its very origin, is a resource theory, right? So we want to call a state entangled if it cannot be prepared locally. But this uh, implies that the free operations are LOCC and not SEP. Okay, but good question. Yes, so if this was the case, then things would be much easier, okay? But it's not the case. So now the question is, of course, well, if we want to study now, if we want to order our state, okay, so we want to get some partial order, we want to say what is a better resource, then what should we do? I mean, we have to study LOCC, but LOCC is very difficult to do. Okay? Fortunately, for the bipartite case, one can show that LOCC is very simple. So in the bipartite case, If I study LOCC transformations among pure states, so among pure bipartite, among pure bipartite states, which is what we consider here, right? We consider transformation from psi to phi because we want to sort our states in the Hilbert space, our pure states. Okay, so if I consider this, then one can show a very nice theorem which tells us that all this mess here can be replaced 
in that case by something very simple, which is just Alice does some operation, as we had it before. She sends the outcome to Bob, and Bob, depending on the outcome, applies just a unitary, and that's it. Okay? So we don't have to consider trans, uh, classical communication back to Alice. We don't have to consider that Bob also does some measurement, just needs to apply a unitary that depends on the outcome of Alice. Okay, so this is a theorem by Hong Kong Law and Sandu Bubescu. I don't remember now which year, but um, I don't remember. But, and this means that everything, or roughly speaking, it means that everything that Bob can do can be done by Alice, up to local unitaries. OK, so this means that this nasty kind of structure, mathematically, boils down to something that is very simple, because here our maps simply look like this. So this is just sum of AI. This is the measurement that Alice does, and the unitary by Bob. That's it. So I only have to check then that this AIs, this set, fulfills the completeness relation. Okay, so this is very easy to do. So this means that in the bipartite case, we, we are very lucky because these kind of transformations, the ones that we have to study in order to study entanglement, become very simple. Okay, so this means now what? Well. I want to use that now because I want to go back to the original problem. I want to study which state is more entangled than the other. Okay? So how can we use that? So let's talk about the state transformation. So does anyone know what the outcome will be? So when can I go from a state psi to a state phi? Sorry? Can you speak up? I cannot. Can you speak up? I cannot hear you. Maturization? Yes, exactly. So this is Nielsen's criterion, which tells us when this is possible. Okay, so this problem has been solved. So we know in the bipartite case when is it possible to go from side to phi. Now, what I would like to do is to tell you how you can derive that using this result here, because this is something that I will also use later on for the multipartite case. Okay, and it's going to be very simple to derive it. So let's see when I can go from psi to phi. Okay, so I have a state psi. Let me just draw this picture also. Now, what do I do? Well, Alice applies some measurement, right? So I get here some A1, tensor identity applied to psi. This would be the first outcome. The second outcome would be A2, tensor identity applied to psi, and so on and so on. Now, if I want to reach the state phi deterministically, it means that at some point of this protocol, I have to end up in the state phi for all the outcomes, for all the branches of this protocol. OK, they must be all transformed to psi. But now I know that the LOCC protocol in the bipartite case looks that simple, and I'm using that now. So this means that the states that I have here must already be a U equivalent to phi, right? Because there's still a local unitary that Bob has to apply in order to get the state phi. Okay, so let's write this condition. So I have that AI tensor identity applied to my initial state psi has to be up to some proportionality factor and a unitary that is applied by B to my final state phi, right? For each of the outcomes, I have to obtain the final state, because I'm considering here deterministic transformations, okay? Not with a certain probability, but all of them have to end up in the same state, fine. Okay, let's write this condition. Well, so the first thing, we have seen yesterday that a bipartite state has the Schmidt, so there exists the Schmidt decomposition, and this means that I can always write a bipartite state up to some local unitaries as some diagonal matrix applied to the phi plus state. 
right? So the phi plus state is, as we had yesterday, just the sum over i i. This diagonal one is simply the one that contains the square root of the Schmidt coefficients. If you apply that to this state, you see that you end up with any state that you want. Okay, so I write my psi like this, and now I use here instead of a d, because I also want to include the local unitaries, I use here some operator g. Okay? Now, of course, the same is true for my final state phi, and I write it as an h tensor identity applied to phi plus. Okay, now I look at this condition here. So let's write it down. We have ai applied to g tensor identity. Psi has to be square root of pi h tensor the unitary. Sorry, not psi, but phi plus. Phi plus. Right? So I have now on both sides, I have the same state phi plus, okay? So I was just using the Schmidt decomposition. Okay, so now, let me consider the case where H is invertible, which just means that I have here, so the Schmidt coefficients are not zero, okay? If you want to consider also the other case, you have to consider something like a pseudo inverse. Let me skip that for the moment. So H is invertible, this means that I can multiply with H minus one. So I simply do that. Okay, it's just rewriting the equation. And now I'm using that the phi plus state has a symmetry because you might know that, that this is true. So if I apply an A tensor identity to the phi plus state, then this is the same as identity tensor A transpose applied to the phi plus. Okay, so you're familiar with that? If not, then just write it down. It's a simple exercise to prove that this is true. And it's something very important in fact, this simple relation, which can be proven very easily, implies this very interesting result. Okay, so using this relation, you can easily prove that this is true. And we are going to use that now in order to show which transformations we can do to obtain deterministically another state. So what I do now is from here, I get that if I consider any unitary, then U tensor you conjugate applied to phi plus will be phi plus. So for any unitary, this is true. Okay, so simply follows from here. Just multiply with another u or a, and you get this relation. And so this means now that if you look at this expression, this means just multiply with u i dagger here. So get here u i dagger, and get identity. Okay, this means that this operator here has to be just the conjugate of this operator here. Okay, so I have that my, and now I'm not sure you don't see this, no? So I have that, that h minus one a i g has to be equal to the square root of pi times U i dagger conjugate, so U i transpose. Okay. And this is actually an if and only if, because you can prove that this is an if and only if. This is the only symmetry that you have from a state phi plus. And this is why you need this to be true. Okay, now let me recall what these operators are. So this is the one that comes from psi. This is the one that comes from phi. These are the Schmidt coefficients of psi and of phi. And this is our measurement that we do, okay? So for the measurement, we still have to impose the completeness relation, okay? So I have to write now ai as a function of the other operators, which is easy, because this is just square root of pi h ui transpose g minus one, okay? And I have to impose that the sum of ai dagger ai is the identity, okay? But now, what is that? So if I insert this expression, then I get the sum of pi. Now, ai dagger, so I have here a g minus one dagger ui conjugate, h dagger h ui transpose g minus one. And this has to be equal to the identity, okay? Now you see that I'm summing here over i, and this g does not depend on i, so I can multiply with uh, g dagger. So I get g dagger g has to be equal to the sum of pi 
UI conjugate H dagger H UI transpose. Okay, this is a necessary and sufficient condition now. So I can go from psi to phi if and only if there exists a probability distribution PI and unitaries UI such that this relation holds. But now what is this relation? Does this sound familiar to any one of you? We have heard the answer already before, but this is exactly the condition that the maturization is fulfilled. So this is exactly, is equivalent to the lambda, so the vector that contains the eigenvalues of G, dagger G, is maturized by the vector that contains the eigenvalues of H dagger H. Okay, so let me summarize this. What we have proven here is that I can go from psi, which I write as G applied to the phi plus, to a state H applied to the phi plus, if and only if these operators G and H fulfill these conditions. So if and only if there exists a PI, probability distribution, and UI unitary, such that this is true. Now, this relation is something very well known in matrix analysis, but also in probability theory. And it's equivalent to this maturization condition on the eigenvalues of our Hermitian operators, the ones that we have here. Okay? So this problem is solved. So we know that there exists a probability distribution and unitary is UI, such that this is true, if and only if the eigenvector containing, so the sorted, but this is implicit, so the sorted eigenvalues of uh, G dagger D, G are maturized by the sorted eigenvalues of H dagger H. So this tells us, just a second, this tells us now that we have solved the question, when can I go from psi to phi? Because now I just have to translate what is this g as a function of psi, right? But this g is just the square root of the reduced density matrix. So this thing here actually is just the reduced density matrix of our state psi. And because of that, we have that this is true if and only if lambda psi, so the Schmidt vector of psi is maturized by lambda phi. Yes, please. Where do you have unit maps? No, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we have obtained now Nielsen's criterion, which says that I can go from psi to phi if and only if the Schmidt vector of psi is maturized by the Schmidt vector of phi. Okay, let me write this as a conclusion from what we have seen. So this is Nielsen's criterion. And this is a necessary and sufficient condition, so it's indeed the criterion. So psi can be transformed to phi if and only if lambda psi is maturized by lambda phi. Mm -hmm. hmm? Is yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm no, no. So I'm always talking here about deterministic. Okay. So this means deterministic transformation. Of course, in a deterministic transformation, I also have branches. But the deterministic means that at the end, all these branches end up in the same state. Okay, so I don't have here a, a state phi prime with a certain probability. I get this probability one, this state at the end. But of course, I have branches. I might have branches. Okay, now what is this relation actually? So this means that um, the, this means the following. This means that if I take the sorted eigenvalues, uh, the sorted Schmidt coefficients of psi, and I sum up the smallest ones. So I take um, L going from some K to the dimension of the Hilbert space. Then this has to be larger or equal to the same expression for phi. Okay. So you might also recognize these expressions here, because these are some very well-known entanglement monotons that we will discuss a little bit later, again. Okay, so, but this is a relation that is very easy. It's very easy to check also. So you just take the Schmidt coefficients of your state, psi and phi, and you compare 
the relation, this is a set of inequalities, you have d minus one inequalities, you compare if this is true. If it is true, then you know that the state psi can be transformed to phi, and if not, you know that it's not possible, okay? No, this depends on, I see this depends on how you, so which ones you sum. So if I start here now from one to k, then I would need to write it the other way around. But I start from k to d, so I'm summing the smallest ones. Yeah. Okay. So what would be an example? So for instance, let's consider the state phi plus. And let's consider two, two qubits. Okay, so what is then the Schmidt vector of our phi plus? Everybody knows it, so I'm considering two qubits. What are the Schmidt coefficients of the phi plus state? Up and down? The Schmidt? Yeah, Schmidt vector of phi plus is? Four qubits, yes, four qubits. Half, half, exactly. Okay, so I'm wondering now whether I can go from phi plus to some state A00 plus P11. Okay, so this is some other state in the Schmidt decomposition. And I assume now that the A, without loss of generality, I assume that A is larger than B. So the, the state, the um, Schmidt vector of this state would be AB. So now, what, when can I go from this state to that state? Well, if and only if this is true, right? So what is this condition now? So I start with k equal to one. If I start from one and I sum up all of them, then I get identity for both of them, get one for both of them, right? Because it's a normalized state. So I start from two, so I take this, the smallest uh, Schmidt coefficient. So I take the second one, and I have to check whether one half is larger or equal to B. Okay, so comparing the two smallest Schmidt coefficients. But of course, I, I sorted it, this is sorted, right? So A is larger than B, and they have to sum up to one, so clearly B is smaller than one half. So this is obviously always fulfilled. So this means, this is always, and therefore we have that the phi plus state can be transformed to any other state of that form via LOCC. Right? Because this is true for all of them. One over experience of two. So, sorry? One over experience of two. No, it's the square of that. So the Schmidt coefficients are the square of the square roots. <laughs> Why? So I have the Schmidt coefficient, the smallest Schmidt coefficient of my phi plus is one half, and the smaller Schmidt coefficient of my phi state is B. Right? And B has to be smaller than one half because this has to be sorted, and they have to sum up to one. So it is like that. Okay, and now, so what we see here is that it doesn't matter, right? Because it doesn't matter which state this is actually, because this is the Schmidt decomposition of an arbitrary state, right? So from the phi plus state, I can go to any other state. So what we see from here is that there's some very important message, namely that from studying LOCC transformations among pure states, we learned that the phi plus state can be transformed to any phi. Okay. But this means that the phi plus state is the optimal resource. Because given the phi plus state, I can go to any other state. Okay, so the entanglement of the phi plus state is largely equal to the entanglement of any other state. So if I want to do an experiment, then clearly I just prepare the state phi plus, because if I want to use another state, I just do this LOCC, which is for free. Okay, so from here we see that the phi plus state is maximally entangled. It's the optimal resource.
Okay, so it's nothing better than that. Now, you might wonder, why do I say the Fabla state and not the Psi minus state? Now, why do I say the Fabla state? Is the Psi minus state also an optimal resource? Sure, because they are all LU equivalent, exactly. So, of course, this, well, as I said yesterday, we care about LU equivalence classes. Because, of course, I could write here any state that is LU equivalent to Phi plus. But I don't need to, because I know that all these states have the same entanglement, right? So I just pick one representative. Could have picked any other, but I pick one representative and say that this is the optimal resource. Of course, all the LU equivalent ones are also an optimal resource, but I don't need to consider them, because this is the same thing. Okay, whether it's phi plus or psi minus doesn't matter, this is locally unitarily equivalent. Okay, but this state allows me to go to any other with LOCC, and this is why it is the optimal resource. And the optimal resource for an entanglement theory means maximal entangled. Okay, but now we have proven that phi plus is not only maximally entangled because there is some measure which is optimized by phi plus, but we have proven that for this state, it holds that the entanglement of whatever measure you choose, okay, this is larger or equal to E of phi for all phi and for all entanglement measures. Okay, this is why I can say this is the optimal resource. Okay? Oh, yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so this is an important message, and we will come to this when we talk about multipartite systems, because there we will see that it's not going to be that easy. Right, okay, so. Now, from the theorem that I had here, which was telling us that this complicated LOCC transformations boils down to something very simple in the bipartite case. We have some more consequences. And let me stress here that this is only true if I talk about LOCC transformations among pure bipartite states, okay? Whenever you relax something, some of these conditions, either not pure or not bipartite, it doesn't hold, okay? It's just for pure bipartite states, you have this simple characterization of LOCC transformations. And from there, it follows, so I write it now for short, just that this LOCC is equivalent to L is doing some operation and Bob doing some unitary depending on the measurement outcome. <coughs> from here, <coughs> we get the following. We get that for bipartite pure states, We have that LOCC is equal to LOCC finite, so I use only finitely many steps. That's obvious. It's obviously a consequence of this thing here, because this is finite. There is no, there are no more rounds, right? There's one round. Alice does something, sends the the classical communication to Bob. Bob applies a unitary. That's it. One round. So clearly. Everything that I can do, even if I consider infinitely many rounds, I can do with finitely many rounds. I can actually do it with one round. Okay? So this is clear that this is true. Okay? And now I wrote it on the, on the wrong side. Sorry. Let me put it here. And what has been proven for this case, for the bipartite transformation, is that this is also equal to SEP. To the SEP probe operations. So remember that I was telling you that the SEP probe operations are mathematically much more tractable than the LOCC. In this case, it turns out to be the same, okay? Can be proven to be the same. And on this side here, we have something else which we called all deterministic protocol. For short, all that. And this is the following. This is a protocol where I start with my state Psi. I do some transformation like we did there. So I get some A1 Psi. Here I get some A2 Psi and so on, and all that means that in each step I do a deterministic step. So this means 
that all these outcomes are LU equivalent. Okay, so I might then go on, do something further, but in each step they are LU equivalent for all the possible outcomes that I have. Okay? Now, we have seen in the bipartite case, this is always like that because we end here. Okay, so Alice does some measurement, and then Bob only has to apply a local unitary to obtain the same state phi. Right? So these states are all LU equivalent. So different local unitaries, but all local unitaries. Right? So in the bipartite case, we have this. So we see that in the bipartite case, this all deterministic protocol is equal to LOCC finite, finitely many rounds, which is equal to the general LOCC, also allowing for infinitely many rounds, and this is equal to the set problem. In the multipartite case, what happens is, I mean, the worst that can happen. So whatever can go wrong here, because this makes it very simple. Okay, so this is the reason why everything is really very simple in the bipartite case. In the multipartite case, it's everything that can go wrong goes wrong. Okay, so first of all, in the multipartite case, this will not be true. So you have protocols where you cannot do it with all that. You need a probabilistic step. This we don't know, and this is also not true. Okay, so this is what makes it much, much harder in the multipartite case, and this also shows very clearly the, the big difference between bipartite and multipartite. Okay, we will come to this later on. I just wanted to tell you here that the reason for why Studying the bipartite case, at the end, is really very simple because you have here everywhere an equivalence. Okay, so you can consider the most simplest protocol, which are these, in order to deal with the most difficult ones, which are these. Okay? Now, the reason why I also write this equation is because, of course, when you, study, when you want to study this now in the multipartite setting or for mixed states, if you want to study LOCC, then because of this complicated mathematical structure that we saw, there is no way that you study it directly. Okay, so you cannot, I mean, I don't know how you could possibly do that because you have to take infinitely many rounds into account. So what you want to do is to consider a set that contains LOCC, which is the separable set, and something that is contained in LOCC. Okay, so then you have, it, you have a bound on both sides and you might be able to prove that the bounds are the same, which means that you also know it for LOCC. Okay, so this is the general idea. Okay, we'll come back to this when we talk about multipartite states. Are there questions so far? No? Okay, so then let's go on to the next chapter, which is entanglement measures and entanglement monotones. So let's talk how we can actually measure entanglement. Okay, so we were now using it always just as a word, basically, and having in mind some examples. But let's look at the definitions. So entanglement measures, which I will for short call NMES, and entanglement monotones. Which is N1. Okay, so first, what is the definition also in the case of mixed states? NMES and NMONS for mixed states. So the definition, what is the definition of an entanglement measure? We have seen that already. Do you recall? When I can I call a function an entanglement measure? It measures a resource, no? And? Exactly. So the condition is that so E is an entanglement measure if E of rho is larger or equal to E of lambda rho for all, let me write lambda LOCC, so lambda LOCC, this is a map that I can realize with LOCC for all states rho and all lambda LOCC being contained in LOCC. Okay, as you were saying correctly, this is the free operation, so this I can do, this doesn't cost me anything, so this can only decrease entanglement. And now if I have an, an entanglement measure, then it has, obey, has to obey this condition, nothing else, just this condition, right? Okay, 
This makes perfect sense. It's very physical, right? This is exactly what we want to have. Now, there is another very useful concept, which is entanglement monotones. Does any one of you know the definition of entanglement monotones? I, somebody was mentioning it yesterday already. No? So entanglement monotone is something that does not increase on average. So this means that E of rho is larger or equal to the sum of pi E of sigma i for all rho and ensemble pi sigma i such that rho can be transformed via LOCC to this ensemble. OK, so here, indeed, I consider different outcomes. I get this probability pi, the state sigma i. And what I'm asking for now is not only that e, I mean, I should not say not only, but it's not that e of rho is larger than e of the sum, which would be the lambda applied to rho, but I'm asking that it's not increasing on average. OK, so it's something different. Okay, so this is non-increasing on average. Okay. Now, in the literature, this condition here is called monotonicity condition. So it's monotonic under LOCC. This condition here is called strong monotonicity condition, which might be a bit confusing because this is not necessarily stronger. Okay. We will see that this is stronger in case we consider pure states or in case we consider convex functions. Okay, but otherwise, it's not necessarily stronger. Nevertheless, this is called the strong monotonicity and the monotonicity condition. This has historical reasons for why it's like that. Okay, so now we have these two definitions. We will see that both of them are very useful. This is really the one that comes from the physical picture. Okay, so this is what we have. This is our resource theory, and we cannot increase with LOCC. This is exactly what that means, right? This definition is slightly different because this means that we cannot increase on average, okay? But we will see that these entanglement monotones are very useful. They can lead to entanglement measures, and they can be used in many different contexts. Okay, so unfortunately, my time is already over. Are there some questions? Yes, please. Yes, so it's, uh, LOCC is different than SEP. So there are examples for even for bipartite mixed states going from a mixed to a pure state. This is a result by Eric Chittamba and um, I think Juan Conlo that you can achieve, so that proves that you can do it with SEP, but you cannot do it with LOCC, okay. even bipartite. This is a state transformation going from a mixed state to a pure state. Well, this is contained in that. So you're asking now for an explicit example for mixed to mixed in the bipartite. Sorry? Yeah. Ah, okay, so it's, it's unanswered. So for mixed to mixed, it's unanswered. It's very difficult. What is answered, and we will, I might talk about this briefly, is from pure to mixed, okay, in the bipartite case, okay? Are there more questions? Do we still have some time or? Do we still have some time or no? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah.